Good afternoon friends, welcome to Shankar Summary 2024. In this video, we are going to discuss the important science and tech current affairs from past year. That is from June 2023 to February 2024. We have handpicked this exam related topics for you. So make use of it. Now let us get into the discussion. Let us discuss about genome sequencing. Before knowing about genome sequencing, first let us understand the basic units of hereditary. That is, what is gene, what is chromosome, what is genome, what is DNA and what are the differences between each of these terms. Firstly, the basic unit is DNA and the DNA is composed of four nucleotides that is adenine, thiamine, guanine and cystosine. So these four nucleotides make up the DNA and a series of DNA make up the gene. So basically the genes are made up of DNA and each gene carries information that determine particular characteristics like our eye color or what is the blood type. Next is chromosome. See many genes make up the chromosome. So humans typically have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosome with one set inherited from each parent. And next is genome. Genome is a entire set of genetic instructions or information carried by an organism. It includes all genes as well as non-coding regions of DNA. So all the genetic information of an organism is called genome. Under genome, there is a classification called chromosome and under chromosome, there are genes and under genes, there is DNA and under DNA, there are four nucleotides. So this is the hierarchy, try to remember that. Now let us see about what is genome sequencing. Firstly, imagine your body as a giant instruction manual. The instruction manual is useful for building and operating you. And this instruction manual has many chapters. Each chapter is a chromosome. Under each chapter, there are many sections. Each section is a gene. Under each section, there are many words. These words are DNA. And inside the words, there are many letters. The letters are nucleotides. That is adenine, guanine, cystosine, thiamine. So genome sequencing is like reading through this instruction manual letter by letter to understand what it is saying. Scientists use special tools and machines to read the DNA sequence which is basically figuring out the order of these letters that is A, T, G, C. Now why is this important? See our genome holds a key to understanding a lot about us. Why we look like this? Why some of us are susceptible to certain diseases and what can be the medication for those diseases? So all these answers can be obtained through genome sequencing. So in simple terms, genome sequencing is like deciphering the instruction manual of life to understand what makes each of us unique. Now let us see the important applications of genome sequencing. The foremost emerging application is a diagnosis of genetic disease even before the baby is born. So this will allow early medical intervention to cure the disease. The second application is making custom made medicines. See with genome sequencing, we can make medicines specific for an individual that can bring down the side effects associated with the medication. So this will also be helpful in designing cancer based medications. Another application of genome sequencing is recombination of a gene which is also called genetic modification. See recently we have seen many genetic modified organisms. So genetic modification is also an application of genome sequencing. And another recent application is identification of microorganism. See during pandemic times we came across alpha variant delta variant of coronavirus. So they were the mutants of primal coronavirus. See such identification can be done by genome sequencing only. And another interesting application of genome sequencing is forensics. When biological remains are obtained from a crime site, the genome sequencing can be used to narrow down the identity. So genome sequencing is also used in forensics. So these are the important applications of genome sequencing. This will be useful for our mains exam as well as prelims exam. Now we shall discuss an MCQ related to this topic. Look at the question here. This question is about genome editing. If you want to know the importance of this topic, just look at these two previous year questions. Here the first question is about Cas9 protein which was asked in 2019 prelims. See Cas9 protein is a molecular scissor used in gene editing. We have seen this in discussion. Look at the another question here. This question is about genome sequencing which was asked in 2017 UPSC prelims. So the question that we are going to discuss now is very important. With reference to genome editing technique, consider the following statements. It involves the introduction of foreign genetic material into an existing gene. The first statement is incorrect. This definition refers to genetic modification and not gene editing. So obviously the first statement is correct. It can help to cure certain diseases in both plants and humans. This statement is correct. Gene editing technology helps to cure certain diseases in plants and humans. Look at the third statement. There is no side effects or safety risk associated with gene editing. 
This statement is obviously incorrect. There are side effects, safety issues and allergic reactions associated with gene editing. So this statement is also incorrect. The question asks for incorrect statement. So the correct answer is option C, 1 and 3 only. So with this let us conclude this discussion and let us move to the next topic. For the first topic, let us take up the Nobel Prizes for 2023. Before discussing 2023 Nobel Prize, let us know some basic information about Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize were awarded from 1901. Initially, Nobel Prize was given only for five fields, that is physics, chemistry, medicine, literature and peace. In addition to these five original fields, Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences was created in 1968. So the Nobel Prize in Economics were issued from 1968 only. Now who selects the Nobel Prize for each field? Look at this table for your easy understanding. The Nobel Prize for Physics and for Chemistry were selected by Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The Nobel Prize for Medicine is chosen by Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute. Literature Nobel Prize is selected by Swedish Academy. Nobel Peace Prize is selected by Norwegian Nobel Committee which is appointed by Norwegian Parliament. Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences is selected by Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Every year Nobel Prize were awarded in Stockholm which is capital of Sweden. But only the Nobel Peace Prize is awarded at Oslo in Norway. As you can see the Nobel Peace Prize is selected by Norwegian Nobel Committee and it is also awarded in Norway. All other prizes are awarded in Sweden. Now whether Nobel Prize has to be compulsorily given each year, sometimes it can be withheld. This happens in two situations, if no worthy candidate is found or during extraordinary situations like World War. See these are the years in which Nobel Prize were not issued. From 1914 to 1918 it is the first World War and the prizes were not issued. And during Second World War also, the Nobel Prizes were not given in several categories. The Nobel Prize in Peace was not awarded in 1948 because the Nobel Committee did not find a suitable laureate who met the Alfred Nobel's criteria. Also, the Nobel Prize in Literature was not awarded in 1972 due to the controversy surrounding the selection process. And also in 2018, the Nobel Prize in Literature was postponed to next year due to sexual harassment scandal within the Swedish Academy. So these are the basic details we need to know about Nobel Prizes. Now coming to the 2023 Nobel Prize. The name of the person who won the Nobel Prize is not important for our exams. So we are not going to look at it. We shall just discuss the discoveries for which Nobel Prize was awarded. Firstly, let us take up the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. See, Chemistry Nobel Prize is given for discovery of quantum dots. So in this discussion, we shall understand about quantum dots, its properties and applications. See firstly what is quantum dot? It is a nano sized semiconductor particle which is made up of materials like cadmium selenide or lead sulphide. These tiny particles can absorb and emit light in different colors depending on their size. Let me explain it simply. Imagine quantum dots as tiny particles which we cannot see with our eyes. When you shine light on quantum dots, they start to glow in different colors. The color in which they glow depends on their size. So the interesting fact is that you can control the color by changing the size of the quantum dots. So the smaller dots emit blue light and the bigger dot emits red light. Basically the size of quantum dots determine the color of light emitted by them. So this light emitting property of quantum dots are used by scientists in many areas. Let us see the applications of quantum dots. First is advanced displays. See quantum dots are used in high quality displays like LED TVs and laptops. They enhance the quality of display by providing high accurate and vibrant colors. If quantum dots are used then the display is called QLED display that is quantum dot LED display. The next application is biomedical imaging. See quantum dots are used in biomedical imaging for creating better images of tissues and cells. They are also used in drug delivery and targeting systems. So they also have application in medical field. Another important application is LED lightning. See quantum dots are also used in solar cells. They can be tuned to absorb specific wavelengths of light effectively. So by using them in solar cells, we can capture a broader range of sunlight. So basically the quantum dots are used to improve the efficiency of solar cells. Lastly, quantum dots are also used in quantum computing. So these are the important areas in which quantum dots are used. So in conclusion, quantum dots are Q dots or nanoparticles with a unique light emitting properties. And the Chemistry Nobel Prize for 2023 is given for the discovery of quantum dots. Now moving on to the next Nobel Prize for Medicine. 
This is awarded for discovery on mRNA that is messenger RNA. So this discovery led to the development of effective mRNA vaccines against COVID-19. The problem with injected mRNA was that it caused inflammatory reactions. In order to prevent this, the scientist modified the mRNA's chemistry and this led to the development of mRNA vaccines. This technology is used in Moderna and P. Pfizer COVID vaccines. Here mRNA stands for messenger RNA. See mRNA vaccines are faster and cheaper to produce than other vaccines. They are also flexible and adaptable as they can be easily modified to target new variants. This is about mRNA and for this only the Nobel Prize for Medicine for 2023 is awarded. Now moving on to the next Nobel Prize for Economics. As we have seen earlier, this prize was only created in 1968 and it was not a original Nobel Prize. And also note that this prize was awarded by the Central Bank of Sweden. Now the Nobel Prize for Economics for 2023 is awarded to Claudia Galdin. This is for her research on gender gap in labor market. She studied about why women are paid lesser than men for the same job. So her research is focused on the gender disparities in labor market. So this is about the Nobel Prize for Economics 2023. Then about the Peace Nobel Prize, it is awarded to Nargis Muhammadi from Iran. She is a human rights activist and the prize is awarded for her advocacy of women's rights in Iran. So we have seen a overall view about all the Nobel Prizes for 2023 and their achievements. With this, we conclude this topic. Now we shall discuss about cryogenic 20 engine which is a CE-20 engine. Recently, ISRO has achieved a significant milestone in its Gaganyan mission by completing the human rating of CE-20 cryogenic engine. This will also power the LVM-3 launch vehicle. So in this discussion, let us see about what is CE-20 engine and the basics of cryogenic engine and also about LVM-3 launch vehicle. See, a cryogenic engine is a final stage of launch vehicle that uses cryogenics. Here cryogenic means the system that operates at lower temperature. Due to the use of propellants at extremely low temperature, the cryogenic stage is much more complex than solid or liquid propellants. The working of cryogenic engine, the cryogenic engine uses liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen as propellants and this CE-20 engine will be used in Gaganyan mission. As we all know, the Gaganyan mission aims to launch a crew of three humans into 400 km orbit for a three-day mission. So CE-20 engine will be a part of Gaganyan mission. This CE-20 cryogenic engine is developed by Liquid Propulsion System Center which is a subsidiary of ISRO. It is the first Indian cryogenic engine to have gas generator cycle. So the CE-20 engine uses a combination of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellants in a gas generator cycle. Now there is another type of engine which is recently developed by ISRO. It is called the semi cryogenic engine. Now what is the difference between a normal cryogenic engine and a semi cryogenic engine means? In a normal cryogenic engine, there is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. But in semi cryogenic engine, instead of liquid hydrogen, we use refined kerosene. So this is the main difference. The advantage of using refined kerosene is that it is lighter than liquid fuel and can be stored at normal temperature. So that is why it is called semi cryogenic engine. Now we shall see about launch vehicle Mark 3. This is also called GSLV Mark 3. And recently ISRO launched its heaviest rocket that is LVM Mark 3 which carried 36 satellites successfully to lower earth orbit. The 36 satellites belongs to UK based initiative called OneWeb Constellation. So in this discussion let us see the basics of LVM3 launch vehicle and about OneWeb Constellation. See LVM3 launch vehicle can launch 4000 kg of satellites into geosynchronous transfer orbit and it can launch 8000 kg of payload into low earth orbit. See, it is a three-stage launch vehicle which consists of two solid propellant strap-ons on its sides and a core stage comprising of liquid stage and cryogenic stage. So these are the three stages of LVM-3 launch vehicle. Now what is OneWeb constellation? It consists of 49 satellites which orbits in 12 orbital planes in lower earth orbit. These orbital planes are 1200 km above Earth. See, this OneWeb constellation is a collaborative project between UK based OneWeb group and ISRO. It totally contains 588 active satellites which are placed in 12 orbital planes with 49 satellites in each plane. This constellation aims to provide high speed low latency internet connectivity worldwide. So this constellation will bring a secured solution not only to the enterprises but also to the towns, villages, municipalities and including the remote areas across India. 
So the main aim of this mission is a high speed internet connectivity. So this is about the one web constellation. In this discussion we have seen the basics of cryogenic engine and what is CE20 engine and the basics of LVM3 launch vehicle in addition to one web constellation. Now let us discuss an MCQ related to this topic. Look at the question here. It is about ramjet and scramjet engines. UPSC is also asking questions about latest technologies in ISRO. Look at this question. It is asked in 2018 prelims and it is about PSLV and GSLV. So there is possibility of UPSC asking question about ramjet and scramjet engines and about other new technologies being developed in ISRO. Now let us solve this question. See the first statement says that unlike ramjet engines, scramjet engines do not rely on aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air. This statement is incorrect because ramjet is a type of air breathing jet engine that relies on aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air for combustion process. Likewise, scramjet engine also relies on the aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air. So both engines do not have any rotating compressor. They only rely on aircraft's forward motion. Now look at the second statement. Both ramjet and scramjet engines have the capacity of operating at hypersonic speeds. This statement is also incorrect because the average speed of ramjet is 3 to 6 Mach. The efficiency of ramjet engine starts to drop when the vehicle reaches the hypersonic speed, that is the speed above 6 Mach. So for this reason only, scramjet engine was developed. See, scramjet engine is an improvement over ramjet engine. It efficiently operates at hypersonic speeds. It even allows supersonic combustion, meaning it can travel at a speed more than 6 Mach. So the correct answer for this question is option D, neither 1 nor 2. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. The next topic is Zodiacal Light. Zodiacal Light is a faint glow of light that is visible on completely dark nights from Earth. This light is created by scattering of sunlight by interplanetary dust in space. But where this interplanetary dust came from? What is the source of this interplanetary dust? These questions remained as a mystery. But recently we have found the answer. We thought that these dust particles are from asteroids. But now we actually found the real source of this dust. Scientists at Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad examined the data from Juno spacecraft. See, this Juno spacecraft is launched by NASA in 2011 to study about Jupiter and its moons. The data from Juno spacecraft recently showed that these dust particles are not from asteroids but actually they are from Mars. So this is really interesting. By studying the data obtained from Juno spacecraft, we have found that the moons of Mars could be the source of this interplanetary dust particles. See, the name interplanetary dust particles means the dust particles which are present between Earth and Mars. So these dust particles were escaping from the moons of Mars and they are scattered between Earth and Mars. When sunlight falls on these dust particles, it is scattered and appears as glowing light in the sky and we can see it from Earth. So this light is called zodiacal light. If you look at the moons of Mars, Mars have two moons. They were Deimos and Phobos. Here Phobos is the bigger moon and Deimos is the smaller moon. So from these two moons only, the interplanetary dust particles emerge. The low gravity of Deimos and Phobos allows the smaller dust particles to easily escape into space. So these smaller dust particles escape into space while the larger dust particles are pulled back by Mars gravity leading to the formation of dust ring around Mars. So the scattering of sunlight by these dust particles create the zodiacal light in the sky. So this is about the zodiacal light. Now let us take up the next topic. Recently, Tamil Nadu government has banned the sale and protection of cotton candy because there was a toxic chemical called rhodamine B which was used in this cotton candies. So in this discussion, let us see the basics of this rhodamine B and about natural food colors and artificial food colors. See the rhodamine B is a chemical which is commonly used for dyeing in various industries like textile, paper, leather and paints. It serves as a coloring agent which produces red and pink color. In powdered form, it appears as green but when water is added, it changes into pink color. This rhodamine B is a cancer causing substance and it is very harmful to human health but it was used in cotton candies for many years. So now the Tamil Nadu government has identified it and banned it recently. Now let us see what are the permitted natural food colors. See carotene, carotenoids which produces yellow and orange colors. Chlorophyll gives the green color. Riboflovin also gives yellow color. Caramel produces orange red color. Curcumin which is sourced from turmeric gives yellow color. So these are natural food colors. Now look at the synthetic colors. These are approved synthetic colors. Carmoisin and erythrocin produces red color 
டார்ட்ராசின் ப்ரொடியூசர்ஸ் எல்லோ கலர் இண்டிகோ கார்மைன் ப்ரொடியூசர்ஸ் ப்ளூ கலர் ஃபாஸ்ட் கிரீன் எஃப்சிஎஃப் ப்ரொடியூசர்ஸ் கிரீன் கலர் ஸோ தீஸ் ஆர் த அப்ரூவ்டு சிந்தட்டிக் கலர்ஸ் விச் விச் இஸ் யூஸ்ட் இன் ஃபுட் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி ஸோ திஸ் ரோடமைன் பி இஸ் அ கெமிக்கல் விச் இஸ் யூஸ்ட் இன் காட்டன் கேண்டி அண்ட் இட் இஸ் ஐடென்டிஃபைட் அஸ் கார்சினோஜெனிக் சப்ஸ்டன்ஸ் விச் இஸ் இட் காசஸ் கேன்சர் Now we shall discuss an MCQ related to this topic. See, this is a three-statement question about endosulfan. Before looking at the answer for this question, let me first explain to you why we framed this question. See, India is a fast-developing country. With the development comes pollution. So, UPSC has constantly asked questions about various pollutants. For example, look at these two questions. In 2020 UPSC, they asked about the source of benzene pollution. In 2019, there was a question about gaseous pollutants from burning crop residue. So questions about pollutants has been regularly been asked in prelims every year we can expect a question about pollutants or pollution that's why we have discussed the rhodamine b in our discussion now look at this question it is about endosulfan here the statement one is incorrect firstly endosulfan is a pesticide and not a herbicide secondly endosulfan is used in cashew plantations of kerala and karnataka and not in coffee plantations the second statement is correct endosulfan has a ability to bioaccumulate in addition to this it is persistent meaning it will take a long time to disintegrate so it is grouped as persistent organic pollutant look at the third statement it is also correct endosulfan is placed in annex a of stockholm convention on persistent organic pollutant see when a chemical is placed in annex a of stockholm convention the parties to the convention must take measures to eliminate the production and use of that chemical note a fact here india is also party to stockholm convention in addition to this in 2011 supreme court of india passed an interim order which banned the production and sale of endosulfan so the correct answer is option b 2 and 3 only now let us move to the next topic Here we are going to discuss about quasars. What do you mean by quasar? Firstly, quasar stands for quasi-stellar radio sources. They are very luminous objects in faraway galaxies that emit radio frequencies. Quasars are the brightest known objects in our visible universe and they are also the most distant objects ever recorded by us. How quasars are formed? See, quasars are formed when two galaxies collide each other. So in future, when Milky Way galaxy collide with Andromeda galaxy, it will create a bigger quasar. Quasars emit radio waves, X-rays and light waves. See, quasars can be detected only using radio telescope. With a normal optical telescope, quasar will look like a normal bright star. The difference between a quasar and a star is very difficult to identify even with a Hubble Space Telescope. The first quasar was discovered in 1950 and it was named as 3C273. Because the quasars are located very distant from us, they are the most ancient objects ever known to us. They give insights into early formation of our universe. So this is about the quasars. Now let us move to the next topic. In this discussion let us see about CRISPR technology which is a gene editing technology in this discussion we shall understand the basics of this technology and the issues surrounding the gene editing technologies know that CRISPR is a short form for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats in 2012 scientists discovered that CRISPR is a key part of our immune system CRISPR is just repeated DNA structures CRISPR Cas9 technology was adapted from a naturally occurring gene editing system that bacteria use as a immune defense. Here Cas9 is a molecular scissor that is used to cut DNA. When infected with the virus, bacteria capture the small pieces of virus DNA. Then they insert it into their own DNA in a particular pattern to create segments known as CRISPR arrays. The CRISPR arrays allow bacteria to remember the virus. If the virus attack again, the bacteria produce RNA segments from the CRISPR arrays that recognize and attach to the specific regions of virus DNA. The bacteria then uses Cas9 or a similar enzyme to cut the DNA apart which disable the virus. So this naturally occurring technology in bacteria is now employed by humans for gene editing. So this is called CRISPR Cas9 technology. Here Cas9 is molecular scissor. So this is the procedure involved in CRISPR Cas9 technology. Now let us see how CRISPR Cas9 technology is used by humans. Firstly they create a small piece of RNA for guidance. This is similar to RNA segments that the bacteria produce from CRISPR array. When introduced into cells 
this guide rna recognizes the intended dna sequence and it attaches itself to the specific target sequence in the cell's dna and it also attaches to the cas9 enzyme then the cas9 enzyme cuts the dna at targeted location so this is similar to what happened in bacteria here note that apart from cas9 other examples like cpf1 can also be used in this technology so this cpf1 cas9 are the enzymes used in this technology to cut the dna and once the dna is cut researchers use our own cells dna repair machinery to add and delete the pieces of genetic material in this way we can edit the genes so this is about the gene editing technology called crispr cas9 now what are the concerns regarding gene editing see first is gene editing makes irreversible changes to every cell in the body of future children and their descendants that would be extraordinarily risky for human experimentation secondly there are issues including off target mutations or unintentional edits to the genome and they have long term health and safety consequences thirdly many consider genome alterations to be unethical advocating that nature should be left to its own course in 2018 a chinese researcher disclosed that he used crispr technology to cure a disease by correcting the underlying genetic problem so this was the first documented case of creating a designer baby finally gene editing can also be used to eliminate species of pest that could upset the careful balance of ecosystem this could have disastrous consequences like disrupting the food web also note that gene editing technologies could be potentially misused for harmful purposes such as creation of bio weapons or spread of genetically modified organisms in the environment so these are the important concerns regarding gene editing now look at an mcq related to this topic see virus has been a favorite topic for upsc there have been so many questions since about virus in past upsc examinations in 2013 2015 2016 2021 there are questions about virus so this year we can expect a question about virus or something related to virus now look at this practice question consider the following statements about virus like particles or vlp vlps are infectious as they contain the native genetic material of virus this statement is incorrect virus like particles are nano scale structures made up of assembled viral proteins since they are made up of viral proteins they can mimic the virus but an important thing is that virus like particles lack viral genetic material and this makes them non infectious so they do not contain native genetic material of the virus so the first statement is incorrect now moving to the second statement virus like particles can be used as carriers for delivery of bio and nano materials such as drugs vaccines and quantum dots this statement is correct Now look at the third statement virus like particles can be used in treatment of hereditary and genetic disorders this statement is also correct vlps can also be used as gene therapy tools now look at the fourth statement vaccines for hepatitis b virus and human papilloma virus have been developed using virus like particles this statement is also correct since vlps lack genetic material and are non infectious they are the perfect candidates for making vaccines VLP based vaccines are already available for hepatitis B and human papilloma virus so the statements 2 3 and 4 are correct so the correct answer is option B with this let us conclude this discussion and move to the next topic our next topic is CAR T cell therapy see this is very important for a prelims exam because UPSC has been asking lot of question related to emerging technologies in medical field CAR T cell therapy is short form for chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy It is a form of immunotherapy that is used to treat cancer. In this therapy, a person's own T cells are genetically modified to enhance the ability to target and destroy cancer cells. Here the T cell is a type of white blood cell which can fight cancer cells. Now let us see how this CAR T cell therapy actually works. In this therapy, regular immune cells which are called T cells are transformed into powerful cancer fighters which will be known as CAR T cells. So basically the T cells are transformed into CAR T cells. As we have seen the T cell is simply a white blood cell that can help the body to find and fight the infections. So they are naturally skilled at killing cancer cells. By using CAR T therapy we modify these T cells by changing their genes to make them even better at attacking cancer. So after the genetic modification we put these supercharged CAR T cells back into the patient's body. So these supercharged cells then go to work seeking out and attacking cancer cells. This is especially effective for blood cancers like leukemia and lymphomas. So overall CAR T cell therapy is like turning your own body into a cancer killing superheroes. 
and note that this therapy is mainly used to fight blood cancers. Recently, Central Drug Standard Control Organization granted market authorization for India's first indigenously developed CAR T cell therapy. And this indigenously developed therapy is named as NEXCAR-19. So this paves a way for commercial launch of CAR T cell therapy in India. It will be available at lower cost compared to other countries. Now what is difference between a normal CAR T cell therapy and this NEXCAR-19? This NEXCAR-19 is developed by ImmunoACT, which is a company incubated at IIT Bombay. This particular therapy is designed to target cancer cells that can carry CD19 protein. This protein acts like a flag on cancer cells which allows CAR T cells to recognize and attach themselves to the cancer cells and start the process of destroying it. So the important keywords here are next CAR-19. What is next CAR-19? It is an indigenously developed CAR T cell therapy. CD19 protein. What it is related to? It is related to the CAR T cell therapy and especially it is related to next CAR-19 treatment. So remember these keywords and what are they related to? This will be useful for our prelims examination. So this is all about this topic. Now let us discuss an MCQ. See this question is about biotransformation technology. We know UPSC is asking questions about latest technology, recent developments in science and technology. So this year also we may expect a question about biotransformation technology. Which of the following is correct about biotransformation technology? The correct answer is option A. See, biotransformation technology is a novel approach to ensure that plastics are processed efficiently and broken down. This is to prevent plastics from escaping refuse streams. In this technology, regular polythene is manufactured with a biotransformation additive. This additive will help in achieving time set biodegradation. Now let us see how this works. Biotransformation additive which is called BioT additive are added to the plastic during the manufacturing process. The final plastic product will retain the properties of regular polythene and can be recycled like regular polythene and it will also be fully biodegradable in the natural environment. This will happen in three phases. See when the plastic is in use, the BioT technology will be dormant. It can also be recycled just like regular plastic. So this is the first phase. When the plastic is exposed to natural environmental conditions such as sunlight, air, water, it will cause the plastic material to self-destruct. See the BioT technology that is present in the plastic will attack the crystalline and amorphous region of the polymer structure. So this will transform the plastic into a waxy substance that is no longer a plastic. So this wax-like substance is not harmful for the environment and this is the second phase. In the third phase, the bacteria and fungi in the natural environment will digest this wax and break it down to carbon dioxide, water and humus. So there will not be any microplastic left behind. So this is about biotransformation technology. This technology is being used in plastics. Now let us move to the next discussion. Recently, our Prime Minister inaugurated the second rocket launch port of ISRO at Kulasegara Patinam in Tamil Nadu. This is near Tutukudi district in Tamil Nadu. Now, what is the significance of this Kulasegara Patinam launch port? Geographically and strategically, this launch port provides a natural advantage to ISRO's future launches because it allows a direct southward and smaller launch trajectory for lightweight satellites. So, this will boost the ISRO's attempt to enhance payload capacities. See, if a satellite is launched from Kulasegara Patinam, it can follow a straight southward flight path. When we launch a satellite from Satish Dhawan Space Center in Andhra Pradesh, it follows a longer trajectory in order to avoid flying over Sri Lanka to protect it from rocket derbies. But when rockets are launched from Kulasegara Patinam, this maneuver is not required as there is no land mass along the flight path in the southward direction. So it is easier to launch satellites from Kulasegara Patinam than from Sri Harikota. Next is, this Kulasegara Patinam launch port is located closer to the equator. The launch sites near equator benefit from the Earth's rotation. This gives a significant velocity boost to the rockets during the liftoff. So this boost in velocity allowed for increased payload capacity and it is advantageous for future missions aiming for geostationary orbit. So these are the significance of Kulasegara Patinam launch port. In this context, let us see about the difference between lower earth orbit, geostationary orbit, geosynchronous orbits. Firstly, what is an orbit? See, an orbit is a curved path that an object in space takes around another object due to gravity. First, let us see geostationary orbit. Satellites in geostationary orbit circle earth above the equator from west to east following the earth's rotation. It travels exactly at the same rate as the earth. 
So this makes satellites in geostationary orbit appear to be stationary over a fixed position. This orbit is used by telecommunication satellites and weather monitoring satellites. Now what is lower earth orbit? As the name suggests, it is an orbit that is relatively closer to earth's surface. It is normally at an altitude of less than 1000 km. This orbit is most commonly used for satellite imaging. It is also used by International Space Station as it is easier for astronauts to travel to and from for a short distance. Now look at this polar orbit and sun synchronous orbit. Satellites in polar orbit usually travel from north to south rather from west to east. So they pass through the poles. That is why it is called polar orbit. Polar orbits are also a type of lower earth orbit because they are at the altitudes within 200 to 1000 km. Now sun synchronous orbit is a particular kind of polar orbit. Satellites in this orbit traveling over the polar regions are synchronous with the sun. This means they are synchronized to always be in same fixed position relative to the sun. It simply means the satellite always visit the same spot at the same local time. For example, it passes the city of Paris every day at the noon exactly. A satellite in sun synchronous orbit would be usually at an altitude between 600 to 800 km. So this is about the important orbits of satellites. Now let us discuss an MCQ related to this topic. Look at the question. Consider the following statements with reference to orbits of satellites. Look at the first statement. Satellites in geostationary orbit circle earth above the equator from north to south following the earth's rotation. This statement is incorrect. The satellites in geostationary orbit circle earth from west to east following the earth's rotation. So the statement 1 is incorrect. Now look at the statement 2. Satellites in polar orbits usually travel past Earth from west to east, passing roughly over Earth's poles. This statement is also incorrect. The satellites in polar orbits usually travel past Earth from north to south over the Earth's poles. So the correct answer is option D. Neither 1 nor 2. With this, let us conclude the discussion and move to the next topic. Look at this topic. Recently, there was a concept called white hole which appeared in news. These white holes are considered as opposite of black holes and it has capacity to generate a new universe. Basically white holes is like a movie running in reverse. In a black hole everything is attracted to black hole and the white hole is just a reverse of it. Everything is emitted from white hole. So an entire universe can be generated from white hole. While comparing the formation, black holes are believed to form from the collapse of massive star at the end of their life cycle. White holes are purely speculative and has not been observed. So they are hypothetical solutions to the equations of general relativity. But currently we don't know the mechanism for their formation. There is a theory called quantum bounds theory and according to this theory, black holes potentially transition to white holes through a bounds. This bounce is called a big bounce and it is similar to Big Bang. According to this theory, there is a possibility of universe emerging from white hole. This emergence of universe from white hole is called big bounce, which is similar to Big Bang. So these concepts like big bounce and white holes recently appeared in news. Please take a note of it. With this, let us conclude this discussion. Let us move to the next topic. See, recently Union Cabinet has approved 100% foreign direct investment in space sector. This is done under the revised FDA policy. Now what are the changes made in FDA norms? Under updated FDA policy, the satellite subsector has been divided into three different types. First is manufacturing of components and systems for satellites, ground segment and user segment. In this segment, the FDA is allowed as automatic route. It means up to 100% of FDA is permitted in this segment. The second one is satellite manufacturing and operation, satellite data products, etc. In this segment, 74% of FDA is allowed. For investment beyond 74%, government approval is required. The third one is launch vehicles and their components. In this segment, up to 49% of FDA is allowed under automatic route. So above 49%, the government approval is required. So these are the three segments under new FDA norms. Now what is the significance of this initiative? See, this revised FDA norms will attract investors globally to invest in Indian space sector. It will boost the Indian space sector as the India space economy is expected to increase from $8.4 billion to $44 billion by 2033. 
the increased private sector involvement will create more jobs and facilitate the adoption of modern technology. Now let us see some basics about FDI in India. As we all know, FDI refers to investments made by foreign entities and can be either establishing business operations or acquiring business assets in another country such as ownership or controlling interest in a foreign company. Basically, there are two types of routes of FDI in India. One is automatic route and another one is government route. Under automatic route, if a foreign company wants to invest in India, they do not need any approval from the government of India. So this is automatic route. They can automatically invest in India. Under government route, a foreign company must get approval from the government of India before investing in Indian business. So these are the two routes for FDI in India. Now in certain sectors, FDI is prohibited. The real estate business, gambling and betting, chit funds, nidhi company, trading in transferable development rights, manufacturing of tobacco products and other sectors which are not yet open for private sector like atomic energy, railway operations, etc. So in these sectors, the FDA is not yet allowed. Also the lottery business, the FDA is not allowed. With this, let us conclude this discussion and move to the next topic. Now moving on to the next topic. Recently, scientists have been studying about colossal black holes, which is 53 million light years away. In this context, we shall know about gravitational lensing, which is an important topic for problems. Gravitational lensing is a natural phenomena that occurs when a massive celestial body bends the path of light around it. Know that the body that causes the light to curve and bend is called gravitational lens. Now let us see how this phenomena occurs. See, gravitational lens can occur when a huge amount of matter, like a cluster of galaxies, creates a gravitational field that magnifies the light from distant galaxies, which are present behind it. Know that this effect is like looking through a giant magnifying glass. It allows researchers to study the details of early galaxies, which are far away to be seen with the current technology and telescopes. An important point to remember that gravitational lensing is based on Einstein theory of general relativity. This theory says that mass bend light. So an object with a huge mass will bend the light passing nearby it. So this is about the concept of gravitational lensing. Now let us see the applications. An important application is magnification. This will allow us to observe objects which are very far away and too faint to be seen. Secondly, with this phenomena, we can find the massiveness and density of the object. See, the more massive the object is, the stronger its gravitational field and hence a greater bending of light rays. So if an object bend the light rays more, then it means it has greater mass. So we can find how massive an object is with the help of gravitational lensing. Thirdly, gravitational lensing act as a natural cosmic telescope. With this, we can observe distant objects in space. Finally, it can help astronomers to know about black holes, dark matter, etc. So these are the important applications of gravitational lensing. With this, let us conclude the topic. Now we shall discuss about the important missions which appeared in news in 2023. Let us begin with Aditya L1 mission. Aditya L1 satellite was launched using Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle that is PSLV XL. This Aditya L1 mission is recently placed in Halo orbit around Lagrangian point 1. Actually, this Lagrangian point L1 is about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Now, why are we placing the satellite in L1 point? The answer is that the satellite placed in L1 point has major advantage of continuously observing the sun without any eclipses. So there is no obstruction while we study the sun. So this is why Aditya L1 satellite is placed in this point and the orbit around L1 point is called as halo orbit. The Aditya L1 satellite carries seven payloads to observe the sun's atmosphere using electromagnetic and particle magnetic field detectors. That is, it has multi-wavelength observation capacity. So this is a very important point. Since Aditya mission is going to study the sun, let us know the various layers of sun's atmosphere. Firstly, photosphere. It is the lower most or the innermost layer of sun's atmosphere. It can be observed directly and from here only most of the sun's energy is emitted. And secondly, the chromosphere which is the middle layer and it is above the photosphere. See, the chromosphere plays a major role in conducting heat from interior of the sun to the outermost layer which is corona. So this corona is the outermost layer of the sun and here the temperature is very high. Actually, it is higher than the inside layers. So basically, corona is the hottest layer of sun's atmosphere. Now let us see what are the Lagrangian points. See, there are five Lagrangian points that is L1, L2, L3, L4 and L5. 
out of 5 points, the L1 has many advantages, like it is one of the gravitationally stable points in space. When a satellite is placed at L1 point, it can continuously monitor the sun without any blockage of view, and the fuel required for the satellite will be very less compared to other orbits. So the position of L1 provides an early advantage to observe coronal mass ejections and solar flares. So we can observe this coronal mass ejection before they can affect the Earth. So it means we can have more time for space weather predictions to protect our satellites. So this is about the Lagrangian points. So with this we wind up this topic and let us move to the next topic. The next topic is about stem cells. Stem cells recently appeared in news because of a successful transplantation of lung derived stem cells and this lung derived stem cells is safe for humans. The patients who received the stem cell therapy showed signs of improvement in their lung function. Specifically, the transplants enhance the lung's ability to exchange gases. Now what are stem cells? See, cells are basic unit of life and it can be divided into two types, differentiated cells and undifferentiated cells. Most cells in our body are differentiated cells, meaning that it have a specific purpose. These differentiated cells can only serve the specific purpose in a particular organ. For example, red blood cells are specifically designed to carry oxygen through the blood. But stem cells are undifferentiated cells and they act as body's raw materials. That means stem cells are cells from which other cells with specialized functions are generated. So all the differentiated cells are emerging from stem cells. So the stem cells are the template. These stem cells have ability to divide and make an indefinite number of copies of themselves. When a stem cell divides, it can either remain a stem cell or turn into a differentiated cell such as a muscle cell or a red blood cell. Remember, under the right conditions in a body or laboratory, stem cells can divide to form more cells called daughter cells. Now there are two types of stem cells. One is embryonic stem cell and another one is adult stem cell which is also called somatic stem cell. So the two types are embryonic stem cell and somatic stem cell. The embryonic stem cells are derived from embryos during the early stage of development. They have potential to differentiate into any type of cells in the body. The adult stem cells, which is also called somatic stem cells, are found in various tissues of body such as bone marrow, skin, etc. It has limited differentiation potential compared to the embryonic stem cell. It is also responsible for maintenance and repair of specific tissues. So this is about the type of stem cells. Now let us see the applications of stem cells. Stem cells play a crucial role in medical research and potential therapeutic applications. First important application is regenerative medicine. Stem cells can be used to repair or replace a damaged or diseased tissues including organs. Secondly, they are used in cell based therapies. Stem cells can be differentiated into specific types of cells and used for transplantation to replace damaged cells or tissues. For example, hematopoietic stem cell transplants are commonly used in the treatment of certain blood disorders. Thirdly, stem cells are used in drug discovery and testing. See, stem cells can be used in the development and testing of new drugs, providing a more accurate model for studying human physiology and diseases. So these are the important applications of stem cells. Now we shall discuss an MCQ related to this topic. Look at the question here, it is about antimicrobial resistance. Already there was a question about the causes of antimicrobial resistance in prelims 2019. Look at this question. Antimicrobial resistance happens when microorganisms like bacteria, virus, fungi and other parasites become resistant to only antibiotics. This statement is incorrect. See, antimicrobials are medicines used to prevent and treat infections in humans, animals and plants. Antimicrobial is a broad term which includes antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals and antiparasitics. So it is not about the resistance only to antibiotics, it includes resistance to all antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals and antiparasites. So this statement is incorrect. Now look at the second statement, antimicrobial resistance has been declared as one of the top 10 threats to global health in 2019. Yes, this statement is correct. In 2019, WHO released a list of top 10 threats to global health and antimicrobial resistance was one of them. So the correct answer is option B, two only. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. Other important topics regarding science and tech current affairs will be posted next Monday. So keep updated. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.